Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, could I welcome members of the press and public to the 11th meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2015. Uh, can I first of all ask all those who are present to ensure that the electronic items are switched to uh, flight mode so it doesn't affect uh, the work of the committee. Uh, can I can also take this opportunity to welcome the Welsh Assembly uh, Public Audit Committee members who are joining us here in the public gallery. Uh, colleagues, agenda item number one is decision in taking uh, business in private. Uh, can I seek agreement that we take uh, items four, five <laughs> and six in private? Are we all agreed? Yeah. Colleagues, can we move to agenda item number two? Uh, which is evidence from two panels on the AGS uh, report entitled Scotland's Colleges 2015. Because we have a full uh, agenda this morning and can ask uh, members and witnesses to be as succinct as uh, possible. Uh, I'd like to welcome our first panel of witnesses, uh, Margaret Monckton, the Principal of Perth College, uh, Paul Little, the Principal and Chief Executive of the City of Glasgow College, uh, Audrey Cumberland, Cumberford, so, sorry, uh, Principal and Chief Executive of West College Scotland, and David Belsey, who is the National Officer of Further, education, of Further and Higher Education, Education of Institute Scotland. Uh, panel are most welcome uh, this morning. I understand that uh, Mr uh, Belsey has a short statement to make before we ask questions. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, having been offered the opportunity of speaking for two minutes at the start, I couldn't resist. Um, welcome the opportunity of giving evidence to the committee this morning. Um, and we also welcome the opportunity of looking at the um, Scotland College's 2015 report. Uh, the IS has welcomed regionalisation from the start. It's always believed that regionalisation can deliver greater accountability, uh, greater transparency. To be, to be fair to the, to the government, uh, it did always link the introduction of regionalisation to making savings. And um, whilst this is regrettable, uh, we, we do recognise that there has been a, a tight um, funding environment. In terms of the, the Audit Scotland report, the DAS found the report disappointing. Uh, we found some of the evidence within it very narrow. Uh, it seemed a little uncritical in its conclusions in places. Uh, for example, in particular, looking at the voluntary sevenths arrangements and the exhibits and uh, at the end of the report didn't quite match the conclusions we felt uh, in the, the main report. Um, there are also the other issues around colleges that are mentioned at the end, such as North Glasgow Cope Bridge, uh, as well as the um, other issues to do with leadership in the, in the sector that the report could have dwelt uh, with greater clarity. Uh, and finally, I, I do note that the um, Audit Scotland have made a written submission referring to compulsory redundancies within the sector. The, I have made some inquiries with my colleagues in the IS. We're not aware of any compulsory redundancies for academic staff. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, can I start with questions, and this is for the, uh, all members of the panel, and firstly, uh, refer to the Auditor General's report, and in particular, it refers to the Auditor General's statement that the impact of the mergers has had minimal uh, impact on, uh, negative impact on students. Uh, I just wonder what uh, the feedback from from any members of the panel would be in respect to that statement? could begin. We, we were the Pathfinder merger um, in advance of the government reform. So we are five years past merger now. Um, it was interesting in the student evaluation or the funding council evaluation, sorry, that when the students were given evidence, they said, uh, merger, what merger? They, they felt that we had attended to business as usual during the whole change process and as such that they had not been impacted negatively during that uh, experience. And in, in fact, I can attest that the college's performance has actually increased uh, some 15% in further education in the success rates and 9% in the higher education rate. So whenever you pull talent and you pull technology uh, and you give uh, a, a diverse curriculum in one spot. I think students really benefit from that. And in fact, we have got uh, more guaranteed places to university uh, since merger than we ever had or even dreamt possible before merger. So the, the student experience of being in the classroom and being supported uh, in terms of pulling student support staff has been one of very positive. And the last uh, student survey 
uh, said that 93% of the students would recommend the City of Glasgow College as a place to study. So from the experience of you, it's slightly more longitudinal than some of the other colleges. Uh, I can say that it's been very positive on the students and I actually recognise that statement. So, I mean, can I just suggest it says in the report here that there's been a 12% reduction in teaching staff. I mean, has there never been any occasion where a student said, you know what, we're losing lecturers in this college, it's having an impact in, in the kind of classes that I can attend or the opportunities that I have in the college? I mean, has a student never come across or a trade union representative never raised an issue about it? Or a student representative never raised an issue about it? So, so and how do we gauge uh, student opinion other than through surveys? Well, maybe I could just finish off and then ask some of my colleagues to come on that. I, I walk around the college, I meet the students, I meet the staff, I listen to them through the formal channels and I listen to the informal channels. And yes, during that change period, you know, people were unsettled during that time, which so, is normal. So just to be clarified then, they're unsettled, but there's been no negative impact on that's, the students. That's correct, yes. So how, so how do those two re reconcile with each other then? Well, so we have a, a happy group of students who are saying, well, now, this is pretty positive, actually, what merger? And now you're yeah. telling me that there's a pretty unsettled atmosphere in the college. So how can both of them reconcile? Well, just to be clear, there's not an unsettled atmosphere in the college. That going through any change process, students would want to ensure that they're well communicated with, that they have all the resources, that the questions that they want answered are answered. And we ensured uh, through written response and meeting them personally and engaging formally and informally that that was the case. So. Uh, I, I merely uh, used the five-year period to give you an example that, that there's been year-on-year -year progress, obviously, during the actual change process itself. Uh, like any change process, there were questions asked, but the success rates speak for themselves. Uh, students have benefited not just from better outcomes, better guaranteed, but in our case, uh, the opportunity to have better facilities. And we also ensured during the process they had better facilities. So. With uh, a student population in, in the region of 32,000 students, obviously we're trying our very best to make sure every single one of those full-time and part-time students has the best, best possible experience. So, so I just asked the three principals who are represented then. Yep. You, uh, I'm, you happy, haven't, I'm happy to respond to that. So you too. haven't, can, but can I just clarify though, you haven't had any representations from students saying these mergers are taking place this is having a negative impact on my education. In Actually, it's quite the opposite. I mean, the core business that we are in is providing education and training to students and making it the best experience that we can for those students and to achieve the best outcomes that we can. So like Paul, in the case of West College Scotland, the performance indicators, which is a key measure of the outcomes of students, have improved at both FE and HE level. That's been substantiated by the Funding Council's six-month merger evaluation that was done, which included speaking to substantial numbers of students who all reiterated the same point, which was they've seen benefits to, to the merger in terms of their overall experience, and I can give examples of that. And to answer your question around do we just simply ask students through surveys, surveys is one small part of how we engage with students in making decisions in the college and influencing how and what we do. So, for example, students are involved in college committees. We have student associations, which are very active. We have students uh, involved in boards at subcommittee level and at full board. So there are a whole variety of ways. Course teams where students are involved working with the lecturing staff so, so in developing their can I just ask then, in terms of the reduction in the places that take place, particularly in part-time courses, how do we consult with those students who are no longer at the college? I mean, I'm sure that their experience hasn't been possible. So how do, how do they seek? How, how do we seek? You know, you're, how do we survey them? Do we survey students who have left the college? You're, you're, you're correct in that the level of part-time provision has reduced over the last couple of years, and that has been the case in West but College. To be fair, that's not the question I'm asking. I'm not asking about the level. Of, at this point, we're not asking that question. The question I'm asking is, if I'm a student who, who no longer is at the college as a result of the, the part-time place has been reduced, then my experience is you know, diminished. It's a pretty poor experience because I've had to leave the college. How do you survey me as a student who's left the college? Because that, that's a pretty poor experience for me, isn't it? I can't continue in the college. Colleges do survey students who leave colleges in terms of our post-course post, post destination analysis, which is information that we provide to the Funding Council on where our students go on leaving college. So for the committee's benefit then, and just for the record today, 
we do survey students who have had to leave the college as a result of the reduction in part-time courses, and we can get access to the survey results for those particular students. Would that be across all of the colleges? My college has not had students leave the college as a result of merger. In fact, the number of courses that we are offering as a result of the merger and the reform has increased. The number of progression opportunities has increased. The level and standards of a consistent, coherent provision across what is quite a large region of the West has improved. We have students who are working across the region together as teams of students with teams of staff in a single college, and there are huge benefits to be gained by that. I have not had a student who has been forced to leave my college as a result of reduction in part-time courses, but I have seen a reduction in part-time provision in the college. Okay, sorry. I, Perth College haven't been involved in any mergers so far. Okay. Ms Gallon? Uh, right, I would uh, like to confine my remarks to the regional boards. Um, uh, I, I really just want to look at the benefits and challenges associated with the arrangements. I want to look at uh, to ask whether the regional boards and bodies have reduced the level of funding uh, available for the delivery of learning uh, and also the quality in, uh, of the direction, leadership and support that the regional boards um, are giving. And if I may um, look, I'm specifically referring to paragraphs 36 and 38 in the Auditor General's report. Um, and just uh, to quote, uh, introducing regional boards has resulted in a complex framework of accountability. Uh, um, and then she goes on to say, individual colleges have expressed concerns that regional boards will affect their autonomy and it has the potential to cause tensions and confusion. Um, so uh, I was quite surprised that the UHI regional board costs £40 million. Uh, and I would like to know, apart from the other questions, um, is that money taken away from frontline teaching or how does the regional board affect, well, particular Paul and Margaret from Perth and, and from Glasgow, does it enhance the delivery of teaching and learning, etc.? And does it impact on your finances? Yeah, can I come in about the 40 yeah. million? Yeah. Um, that has been taken from the written submission by Dr. Michael Fox. Yes. And the expression, our annual budget is 40 million, that's the income, that's a, an income budget I figure for all of the, the FE colleges in the region, yeah. it's not the cost of the regional board. The cost of the regional board is 200,000 per annum. Okay. I, and that has been uh, held for uh, since the, the regional board has been in operation. Not 40 million seemed a lot, but he does yeah. say our annual our budget. budget. So by saying our yes. annual budget, yeah. and he's I, writing as the chair of yeah. the regional board, uh, he seems to assume that uh, it's his annual yes. budget rather than yours. So 200,000. So 200, just to ask 000. about the impact uh, okay. on colleges in terms of autonomy and finances. Okay, it is fair to, to say and to reflect that our flexibility and autonomy has been restricted uh, by coming together as a region for FE. In the Highlands and Islands, we have a long tradition of working together as a partnership uh, for HE uh, as a university partnership. So, in effect, before regionalisation, uh, throughout Scotland in the college sector, we were already working together very well as a partnership. So um, our, our perspective, our individual board's perspective of the rationale for a regional board is very different to the rationale uh, being used across Scotland because uh, we have university court, um, we have the FE regional board, which is a subcommittee, of court, or rather, sorry, pedantically, a committee of court, and we have our own boards of management. So, under regionalisation, we now have three layers of governance uh, on our FE uh, activity. We've got two layers of governance on our HE activity, but three on our FE activity. And that is, is causing um, a lack of, of flexibility. We have always acted uh, 
primarily for our sub-region, for Perth and Kinross, um, and also for the benefit of the region, because FE has always been a feeder into HE, has always been a precursor in curriculum pathways, etc. So we are just formalising arrangements more. Um, and it is costing us 200,000 a year, of which Perth is paying about 60,000. Right. I am aware before I came here, I was a lecturer uh, in the UHI, and that's 1999, so I'm aware of the very good practice and how well yeah. the colleges uh, work together. But you, I, I have heard from other colleges, uh, not Perth indeed, yeah. that they feel that some of their autonomy has been lost. Uh, yeah. And we've always felt, well, when I was a lecturer, that each region could respond to the employment needs within Absolutely. their area. And, of course, Orkney, Shetland, Western Isles, North Highland, Perth, it, it, they are very, very different yeah. areas. So can I just ask you, apart from your 60,000, which uh, uh, I'm sure would be helpful in your budget, how do you feel that uh, the additional layers of bureaucracy, you use the word restricted, how mm -hmm. does it restrict what you can do as a principal of Perth College? There are, there are challenges to the autonomy of our board and therefore me as a principal and chief exec um, as to where our authority lies, where our responsibility stops and starts. Um, and it's mainly being caused because FE is now being seen um, as the responsibility of university court. And with the best of intentions, university court uh, doesn't see that as its main um, reason for, for existence. So I, we constantly get challenges. So it's not challenges for, from the FE Regional Board. Uh, the FE Regional Board understand FE. Uh, it's comprised of all the chairs of our boards of management and some independent members. And it's working increasingly well. Uh, but the interface between that board and university court uh, is throwing up uh, questions about our autonomy and our responsibility and accountability. That's very helpful. And can just find, uh, can I perhaps ask Paul uh, a different experience within Glasgow, but maybe you could tell us what the cost of the Glasgow Regional Board and how much your college contributes towards the cost and do you find it helpful in terms of the student learning experience? OK, I'd be happy to give you a, a written uh, reply on the exact costing because that's a, a bit of a fluid situation, but I'll give you some indication of that. In terms of the overall autonomy, it is true that colleges have had a reduction in their autonomy and indeed that wouldn't be tolerated by our higher education colleagues. But that loss of autonomy has also because, because of the, um, the class, reclassification of colleges uh, as arm's length bodies. And so they, in, in a sense there's a, if you like, a conflation of these issues. Certainly within Glasgow um, we have two levels of governance between the regional board and assigned colleges. But on a practical level, and when you strip away a lot of the negative headlines that have been around Glasgow, I certainly have found that um, in terms of the specifics of, of the regional board and the interface of the college, I haven't experienced uh, a degree of loss of autonomy, certainly at an operational level. In fact, the opposite. We've been very supportive of the regional board in, in, in helping to set it up. It's still very much in its early days there, and in fact, um, it's presently the... the uh, Secretary is actually located at the City of Glasgow College. So the the impact of the Glasgow Regional Board had a, had a very positive impact in bringing the three colleges closer together and working in strong collaboration. And yes, there was the potential impact on funding and the finances. Uh, we were very fortunate that the Funding Council stepped in and actually supported that and funded that directly. Now, in recent times, um, we have been, um, there is the potential to top slice some of our budget to support that. We are presently making representation to the Funding Council to reduce that. So that's still a matter of discussion, and, and I, I believe that they're listening to us in terms of that, and they're continuing uh, to provide some of that funding whilst recognising that it was always the intention through the guidance that, that the college sector would pay for that. So in terms of um, 
regionalisation in Glasgow, yes, there has been a lot of negative publicity, but behind that has been a huge amount of development in the colleges, a huge amount of protection of student learning, a huge amount of continued input to the socio-economic development of Glasgow and responding to the needs, including of a map that we've produced up to 2020. So we've been looking very closely at that. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Perhaps I can start by saying that I thought the Auditor's General report was actually quite uh, positive in most respects. Um, they recognised that college finances were sound, that planning for mergers was good, and that the, respect, the sector responded well to the period of very significant reform. And I think what you're telling us today reflects that. And also that the colleges continued to meet their targets for learning. However, it is true that the number of part-time students has dropped, as, as, as members of the panel have already indicated, and that is in accordance with government policy to focus on full-time courses leading to qualifications and hopefully employment. Um, how significant has the fall in part-time courses been in your areas and the, the actual teaching hours, the actual, hour, the actual hours that are, that are being given on courses, has that been maintained? Can I answer quite straightforwardly from, from Perth? There has been no reduction, no discernible reduction in part-time learners at Perth College. Um, we are quite convinced that we were doing the right thing for our region. Um, so no matter what government policy was uh, determining, we were originally doing the right thing. Um, so the balance of full-time and part-time has been relatively stable, in fact, very stable. Um, so there, there hasn't been that, that swing as has been displayed in the rest of Scotland. Um, as to the number of hours, I, in order to um, make ends meet with the cut in funding, the Funding Council had allowed us to go down to 16 credits worth for a full-time student. In Perth, we only went as low as 18. So we didn't go um, to the 16 because we wanted to protect the student experience. So um, we have taken decisions locally um, to make ends meet in a different way from perhaps other colleges. Certainly in Glasgow, the game may be slightly different from the rest of the sector. 60% of our fund of the ability is higher education and 40% is further education. And because we generate uh, considerable sums of money from commercial and international, we'll be able to use some of that money to offset some of the uh, loss of provision in part-time learning. But there's no doubt about it that part-time learning um, has impacted particularly the leisure learners, has also had an impact on the opportunity to retrain and uh, reskill. However, we've been focused in uh, supporting the economy of Glasgow and also because we're a city centre organisation, trying to ensure that we work with the businesses and indeed the uh, um, learners that need our help, particularly the new citizens of Glasgow. So we have uh, worked really hard to protect that. And indeed, as I mentioned earlier, the um, in terms of a Glasgow perspective, the, the, the map that we produced has actually uh, allowed us to plan an expansion, particularly in the communities, to ensure that that's actually increased. So yes, it is a challenging situation, but I think colleges are very resilient, they're very adaptable. Yes, we're very focused on Scotland's young workforce, but we're within our own budgets and our own other capabilities, we are making every effort to protect the part-time learners. But as I said earlier, the City of Glasgow College has perhaps not had the large degree of part-time learning profile that there would be elsewhere. In the case of West College Scotland, is responsible for around 10% of the overall uh, provision in Scotland in colleges, and our part-time provision in the last year has reduced. In saying that, we've had a particular focus on our over 25-year-old age group and the numbers have increased in full-time provision in relation to the over 25 uh, groups. Can I, can I add on behalf of the staff that um, there's been a very clear move across the sector and I think the, the statistics support the, the large cut in the part-time number of students. That is, of course, going to disadvantage uh, women uh, and those with caring responsibilities. Um, it's, it would be unfair to put the cut of part-time students simply down to the merger process. 
Uh, it is one in which the, the government has refocused the priority of the sector more towards uh, preparing 16 to 24 year olds for the world of work, which are, uh, and also reducing the number of non credit awarding, non credit awarding, awarding um, courses that have been cut. Um, but EIS members are very clear that there, there are fewer courses uh, and that part time courses have been hit hard. But perhaps. Uh Mr. Bell, sir, I can maybe mention there that the number of women on the full-time courses has actually increased by 15% over the past few years, so there are some positive aspects there. Mm. However, um, is it true, uh, according to the figures that I'm seeing here from, from various sources, that the outcomes of the students on these full-time courses are much better than in the past. In other words, there's more, there's more students leaving with qualifications, more students leaving, going into positive destinations, which is what, of course, it was targeted for. Well, as I said earlier, in terms of full-time FE and HE provision at West College Scotland, the performance indicators have gone up by 2% and 3% in both cases. So, yes, the outcomes are improving. And I think, as David said and, and Paula said, is that the curriculum is being designed around what employers want and what they need. Work experience is a huge uh, feature of much of the full-time provision that colleges are providing now, meaningful work experience. And again, that, that's something that is being built into full-time provision, which is a positive, which is a major shift in, in what colleges do. And if you just, uh, without rehearsing the statistics of the great increase since merger, before merger, the, the collective colleges that formed the City of Glasgow College were, in essence, below sector average, now they're above sector average, and in fact uh, we're now uh, ranked third in Scotland and, and further in higher education. Now that, that's a huge opportunity advantage to students when they come to the college that they can be, and their parents and their teachers can be more assured that they're getting even higher quality education than before merger. Well, I think full-time students have um, got out of the um, the recent change is better than part-time students. And as you said, completion rates are, are up in most places. Uh, there's widening access to universities, greater articulation. There was a, an agreement signed in, in Glasgow with the University of Glasgow uh, only a few weeks ago. So yes, for full-time students, there are some uh, elements of good news. Just briefly, that both uh, Margaret and Audrey said there'd be no reduction in part-time students, but in the Auditor General report on uh, page 25, there's been a reduction since 2008 to 2014 of 150,000 part-time students, 48% reduction and a 41% reduction in students over 25. So if there hasn't been a reduction at Perth College or another other there haven't been reduction at your colleges, there must be huge reductions elsewhere because that's what's in the report. Part-time students' headcount have reduced at West College Scotland. What's increased are the number of full-time students who are over the age of 25. Yeah, but well, can we just be clear here, though? The question that was asked was part-time courses, so can we just clarify, Paul, can you confirm has there been what the numbers of reduction has been in your college? Um, because it's over that five-year period, I, I can't confirm, but I'll write to you with that written confirmation. But is there any recent figures in the last year? No. Or, I mean, it must be something that's been presented well, no, well, to your board. Because our profile was, uh, the, the merger was carefully planned to accommodate the development of the new campus, we were largely a full-time college. And yes, we did have a part-time provision, and we protected that part-time provision. So there hasn't been a significant cut to that part-time provision other than through leisure learning, but the leisure learning was always in, in that volume of students a very small percentage. I think the, the question that you're asking is, you know, so where are the, where's that 48% yeah. reduction? Yeah. Yeah. And I think obviously that's a, a, a question that the Funding Council can certainly answer for you. Uh, or, and obviously Scotland's College can provide a more of a written detailed answer because certainly for my college, it, it hasn't been um, significant. However, you are right, there has been that reduction overall. So can you clarify the point made about the leisure classes then? These, these would be um, non-accredited courses. So these are hobby courses? Hobby, hobby courses, courses, if you will. Uh, important courses so in the lifelong So why would you call them learning. hobby courses or why would you? I mean, do they, do they have less importance because they're not accredited? Is that the way the college look at it? No, no I think actually... I call them leisure courses, I think, hobby courses, I think, is... is well, that's the, what the minister referred to them as, but... Well, I, I, I would call them leisure courses, and actually, in the past, with so lifelong learning... So you would disagree learning, with the term hobby courses, then? 
in the past. Lifelong learning has been the route to wider access. Uh, I wouldn't want to disagree with the minister. Yeah. <laughs> so I would, I would say that we would uh, call those leisure courses. In, can I offer some statistics that we've pulled together as a regional um, body? So in the Highlands and Islands, the part-time student number for 11-12 was 28,000, for 12-13 was 27,000, and for 13-14 was 28,000. So there has been no reduction in the Highlands and Islands part-time. So just before I bring Tavis Scott on, you, just be, to be clear, then the information that we're looking for from the two remaining in colleges is clarity on whatever reductions take place. Uh, but your understanding is that this has been minimal, and we should look elsewhere for the other colleges that have reduced their courses. Scott. Thank you. Can I drag you away from hobbies and onto money? Um, the, I wonder if I could ask both Glasgow and West of Scotland what the costs of merger were. Yep, I can uh, cover that. In relation to the merger integration costs, so that I would describe that as being things like due diligence, um, you know, kind of estates work, um, integration of systems, etc., etc., uh, was around 1.5 million. We spent uh, 1.5 million on software, hardware associated with uh, the integration of major systems. So that would include things like our student record system, our HR systems, our student funding systems, our payroll systems, etc., etc. And then a further 5.4 million on voluntary severance for staff. In terms of, of Glasgow, um, there has been uh, a cumulative savings since merger of 26 million. I no, want the cost, not the savings. I'm well, sorry, I'll come on to savings. I want to ask about the cost of merger. The, the, the cost of merger was in excess of five million. Um, how much? Forgive me. How much in excess was it? Well, for example, the, the severance budget that uh, we were in a different position because we also had uh, funding from the funding council yes. that wasn't available to the other colleges. Yes, so we had a provision, for example, of over four million for for uh, severance costs, and uh, in essence, our working figure that we was in about six million. Uh, and were you? Thank you. Were you, were you asked to provide those figures to the funding council and to government? Yes. So you'd be puzzled, as I was, as to why the Funding Council nor the Scottish Government could provide Audit Scotland with the cost of merger, as you would have read in the Audit Scotland report, when you clearly did provide that information. I'm very grateful for you for providing that information. You obviously did. Yes. And you, were, you were asked to provide that information on the costs of merger, specific costs of merger, that you very helpfully given this morning to the Funding Council and to the Government. I think the Funding Council will maybe have those detailed figures because yeah. they work very closely with each individual Absolutely. colleges to, to provide that. It's perhaps that, it, that mergers are in transition. I, I mentioned that we're five years past merger. During, because mergers are on a phase basis, perhaps the, uh, and, and we would say that, that the, the first phases of merger are now complete. Perhaps mm -hmm. they are not saying that the mergers are complete in the more recent cases. Yeah, well, those are questions so obviously we can pursue another way, but I'm just grateful that you, you were able to provide the costs, which uh, is a stark contrast to the evidence we heard when we had Audit Scotland here. Um, Mr Little, you mentioned savings, so let me, let me ask you about that. Um, obviously, the Audit Scotland report says that um, £50 million pounds of efficiency savings per annum are to be achieved from this financial year forward. Appreciate that's for the whole of the sector. Uh, Audit Scotland said there was no evidence of that in the in the report, which I'm sure again you're familiar with. Yeah. Um, can you give us? Can you give? Can you help the committee with any evidence on that? Yeah, I mean we, we we are very clear that in terms of to date recurring annual savings are 5.5 million. Uh, uh, which relates to VS, and there's about half a million in relation to other savings. Now, I say other savings, again, that's around things like license agreements, contracting, uh, you know, bringing three contracts in, in, into one, and we're looking to make some further savings uh, around our estates and other kind of contract opportunities where the three legacy college contracts are coming to an end, and we're renegotiating single contracts with some of our suppliers. So there are still savings to be made, but those are certainly the initial savings in the first two years of merger. And are you under, I mean, obviously these are per annum, these are not just, you've described a number of uh, issues this morning, which I can well understand, but possibly only being one-off, or are they yes, uh, recurring? Yes. Well, in terms I, of, our, our, our payroll savings have been reduced yes. by 5.4 million, okay. yes. Yeah. Thank you. If I can give some context. Um, in terms of um, the City of Glasgow College, on merger, City of Glasgow College was about a tenth of the whole sector. Yeah. responsible one in ten students. So that figure that I mentioned in excess of five million, would, it would be in line with that for overall for the sector. 
Uh, in terms of, of the context, because I think it's quite important to, to recognise that, uh, as Steve had mentioned, that the, the merger didn't happen in isolation, that they have been conflated with government reform and regulation and, and reduction. I think the, the, the money that we have potentially saved by merger has been offset by the diminishing reduction in revenue funding in the college. So in a sense, having taken a bold step forward, we have stood still. So you're saying that actually the way we should look at the £50 million pounds of savings the government say have been made and will be made from this year onwards, we, uh, both the funding council's reduction in the support for the, for the sector as well as the savings that you very carefully and helpfully identified to the committee this morning? Is it both these factors that... Well, I think you need to that? factor in the wider re the revenue funding yeah. uh, and, and obviously the, the gap that's beginning to emerge in student support funding as well. Yeah. So I think that the challenge is to, to keep in mind that, that mergers were part of that reform, but there was the reclassification that had an impact on the colleges, and then there was the, the, the uh, loss of parity with higher education funding, and as such, the colleges, since my particular merger, have year-on-year year had a, a, a diminished uh, revenue funding, and that's most marked in recent years. How much has it been cut by in in terms of what, what your predecessor bodies would have had compared to what you now have in the 15-16 financial year? Or maybe you could write to us with that kind well, of information. We'll write to that, but give you an indication yeah. since that, that period there's been a, a 12, for the sector, there's been a 12% reduction yeah. uh, up to 2015. Across the whole sector Across the whole sector, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And just to, uh, sorry, for, this is the audit committee, so you'll forgive me for being concentrating on the numbers. Uh, um, are your own savings audited by your own um, college audit professional bodies? All colleges are, are audited both internally and externally. Uh, so they have ex internally appointed auditors and a separate externally appointed auditors. Yeah, so there's yeah. very robust and careful and diligent Good. auditors. No, that's very helpful. And, and those are then again provided to the funding council and therefore by definition to the government. So there's absolute clarity about no doubt, no, not just your colleges but others in that context. Yeah. yeah. Correct. That's very helpful. Thank you. Major Don. Thank you very much. Mr. Convener, and good morning, colleagues. I'd just like to pick up on one particular issue, since we are talking about money, and that is an issue which comes to me quite often wearing my engineer's hat, that, that uh, college courses where, let me, let me give you two examples to make the point, if you want to teach somebody to cut hair, then you know, in a couple of weeks' time my hair will have grown and you can cut it again. There's, there's no significant cost in that. Whereas if you want to teach somebody to put cement round bricks, you finish up with a wonderful-looking wall, but not one with a set of bricks that you can use next time, so you have to buy more bricks. Now, many of the engineering courses, and not uniquely engineering courses, are more expensive to run than some of the others for precisely that kind of reason. To what extent do you feel there are pressures to provide or not to provide courses simply because they cost more to put on? Can I just start by saying we do recycle the bricks? Um, we actually, in which case they weren't put together very well. We actually recycle the mortar too. We use, <laughs> we use the used mortar and remix it. Yeah, uh, okay. We have a machine that does that. Yeah, so, okay. um, take point. It does take a bit of time and effort, yeah. however. Um, so your point's well made. We have been that. That's so why. Yes. That's why the funding, the revenue funding, and the the FE teaching <laughs> grant was weighted higher for the, the higher costs of delivering certain um, subject areas, for example, engineering. I, that weighting has changed, and we're now approaching a simplified funding model where we will have our funding put into five subject funding categories. So we are at the very early stages of that. So I don't believe there's any case studies available as to how that new funding methodology will support us to enable these higher cost programmes to be funded appropriately. It's too early into the change of funding methodology. Concerns about the scenario that you have just described, where the funding methodology allows that flexibility, and within a college, in terms of managing your own resources and curriculum portfolio, there is some of the portfolio is less expensive to deliver, some is more expensive, and you can, you know, the the, the two can balance. So I don't have any concerns. If I can give you some reassurance from Glasgow that uh, in just over ten weeks we'll be uh, taking delivery of a 60 million pound campus. 
uh, a key and a core part of the campus is actually engineering, both marine engineering and renewables engineering and mechanical engineering. So we're, we're playing our part to the renaissance of engineering in Glasgow and we have developed a STEM centre in association with the local schools. So we're working very carefully to maintain the balance between providing important hairdressing courses and important engineering courses. Yes, I, I'm not doubting the importance of all of them, but I think the point was well made. I just hope that the brickies remember to use the right mortar when they get out there and build real houses. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Kimbira. Um, I mean, I appreciate the, the situation is, is, is different in, in West Glasgow and, and in Perth in, in terms of the, the merger experience in Glasgow, uh, starting in this process earlier in terms of City of Glasgow College, Perth not um, a merger as such, but you all um, paint a, a fairly re rosy picture of the, of, of the process that, that you've been through, so <coughs> presumably you wouldn't have any uh, concerns about a further process of merger in the sector. Uh, uh, you know, we'll let let this settle down and we, we could do this again and save more money and make more improvements? I'm not sure how to answer that question, actually. <laughs> um, Principals could answer that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if I understood your question correctly, there's no question, and I think the, the report makes it quite clear that the sector as a whole has been hugely successful in reforming over what has been a short period of time within an environment and context which has been complicated and multi multifaceted in terms of uh, the changes that we've had to cope with. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that being a regional college across the West region has given with the vocational system in the West, a um, far higher level of influence, of authority, is helping to raise the value of vocational education, which is absolutely a key objective of the sector, and I'm sure uh, many individuals around, around this table. Uh, could I go through this amount of change again in the next 18 months? Um, I'm actually only 21 years old, so have aged uh, considerably. Uh, there, there is no question it's been challenging at a personal level and in relation to the staff in the college and the senior teams and the staff as a whole. Going through change is never easy. I do think it's important that we now, uh, if you like, the dust is settling, is that we absolutely maximise the true benefits of being uh, regional colleges and having a, a, a regional structure and that we continue to work through some of the challenges around the reclassification and what that, that's presenting and the ongoing uh, challenges with the funding situation that we have whilst maintaining and delivering uh, the targets and the activity that the Scottish Government expect us to do. A, a, a quick example would be developing Scotland's young workforce is an absolute key Scottish Government priority and is a key, co a, a key college priority in terms of working with young people in schools. The challenge there is that the colleges have a huge role to play in delivering against the recommendations of, of developing Scotland's young workforce, but there are difficult then choices and decisions to be made around what, what, our, what our provision should be geared towards that particular uh, policy area, which by definition then means that we have to make some difficult choices elsewhere in what we do, i.e. colleges can't do everything and be everything to everyone with a limited resource. I've, I've just recently come back from America and I wish I could claim the Fifth Amendment when it comes to Glasgow, um, because obviously Glasgow is very much in the attention and the headlines. Um, I think what has been shown is that the three colleges in Glasgow have worked increasingly collaboratively and very close together. And uh, as indicated earlier, we now have a, a map for uh, the shared curriculum right across Glasgow to 2020. So in a sense, we're busy trying to ensure over the next few years that we deliver that map. And from my own experience, um, which uh, I have well over 15 years involved in merger, I've seen different mergers. Uh, in different jurisdictions, and I, I know that they're all context-specific. So if there's a clear need, if there are clear benefits, if there's a clear vision, and that that's well articulated, then potentially there could be further mergers. However, we're busy in Glasgow bearing in the existing mergers and trying to ensure that the collaboration that they've got is there for the benefit, not just of the students, but of the economy of Glasgow. And if uh, we, we're able to do that for the next period, I think I'd be content with that. 
Um, my response to, to that question would be that uh, some of the uh, fundamental principles of the, the college regionalisation were to remove duplication, to increase the sharing of services, um, and to increase um, the coherent voice of the sector. I don't think that was a government priority, but it was certainly one that we took out of the regionalisation was the benefit of that coherence of voice in promoting the benefits that the sector brings to the economy and to lifelong learners. Um, I would, we haven't been a part of the merger situation. I, I really don't know what the trajectory in the Highlands and Islands will be, but there's certainly still a lot of individual institutions in that, that area. Um, I would just, as an economist, say that there's a tipping point between economies of scale and then diseconomies of scale. So it is making that, that judgment. When is an institution too big to keep um, focus on its frontline production, which is um, healthy and appropriate learning opportunities for uh, the people of Scotland? I, mean, I suppose if I, if I could convene, I'm quite interested in the, the EIS perspective on. I mean, the, the principles are telling us that you know savings can be made. There's no, um, there's reductions in, in uh, the numbers of part-time learners, but you know we're, we're not too concerned about that because it aligns with the, the government's priorities. Do you think we could could we make even more savings in this sector by getting well, uh, more people working together? Um, Is that doable? I, I'd say that. When you look at them, I think um, Audrey mentioned the, the savings from West College Scotland being around five and a half million, mostly due to voluntary severance. So that's less staff, that's fewer staff in the sector, and it's delivering, depending what metrics, which metrics you look at, the same FE activity. So there are fewer staff delivering the same amount of FE activity uh, in terms of uh, uh, some of the metrics um, to the same quality because. The, the Auditor General's report and the sector's clear that quality hasn't dropped. So there, where that pressure has dropped, uh, has fallen, is on the shoulders of the staff. And I mean the staff across the whole uh, sector, management, but also teaching staff and support staff. So there is increased workload. There are larger classes. There are uh, fewer hours being, uh, being given to deliver some courses. Um, there are increased absence rates. So... I think possibly, yes, there's always efficiencies to be made, but it'll come at a cost, and, and the cost will be the staff. Um, I think the EIS is hopeful that the, the present round of mergers will, give, will have uh, an opportunity to, to settle out, to consolidate, and if there are any future mergers in, 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 the, um, in the offing, that they be carried out in a, in, in a, a longer, drawn-out period of time better planned in a way, because some of the recent uh, mergers took place rather quickly. Um, I suppose from that there, I'm just ask the principals, are you able to give us an indication what, what is happening to your absence rates? I don't have the exact figure, but uh, it's from memory pretty stable, actually. You, you don't... You, you don't recognise that there's a trend associated with, with mergers. That's not been your experience. Actually, no. I mean, I, I, I would agree with what David said there is that, as I said earlier, change has been significant and staff, and it's a credit absolutely to the staff that they absolutely have kept the focus on what we're here to do, which is about learning, it's about teaching, despite the, 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 the change in the turmoil uh, that, that's gone on around them and have not lost that focus. And in my, certainly in my case, and I know in other colleges have been very positive and embraced the opportunities that working as part of a, an increased capacity enhanced scale of college has given them in terms of course materials, in terms of sharing practice, teaching practice, uh, sharing best practice. Uh, you know, le le lecturers and support staff across the college have been very quick to grasp the opportunities that that has presented. I think mergers can be painted as very difficult, and, and certainly they are on a, on a personal level. 
uh, in terms of absentee, and that, that has never been a, a major feature or of concern. Obviously, we monitor that. Um, but I think we have to balance that with the, the opportunities that staff had through merger. Uh, all our staff have had an increase in their pay. We provide the living wage now to, if you like, the lowest paid members of staff. Uh, the salaries of the lecturing staff have all been harmonised. And at the lecturing level, that was harmonised at the highest level. There have been, at the promoted level, many more opportunities, mm -hmm. both in terms of the challenge of management, but also the professional development opportunities. So in one sense, yes, there's been a huge amount of change and yes, a huge amount of, of, of pressure on staff, but they have risen to that challenge. College staff always do, and we're very proud of what they do. And I think um, providing we can uh, continue that in any change, in a phased, managed, and where possible, supported way, I think David's right. If 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 there is going to be further change, whatever that change is, uh, if the government continues to support it at the level certainly that we were received, then I think the the transition to that new change will be much better than perhaps the the more condensed uh, change that happened after our merger. I think it's fair to say that that the significant threat to the learner experience, the student experience, and to the burden on staff is the continual funding cut that the sector is experiencing. Um, so perhaps it's not the mergers per se, but the fact that we have um, all, as a collective, um, had to make efficiency savings of 12% in real terms over the past four years. Yeah, just to, to, to finish on uh, this point, I suppose one of the other frustrations or concerns with, with the report that the Auditor General has put in front of us is that it doesn't uh, it, it quite understandably doesn't give us the experiences the convener mentioned of people who are now outside the system or people who otherwise would have been in the system under previous models but no longer have that opportunity to be in and particularly uh, uh, thinking of women who might have been more attracted to part-time study um, and also to uh, older learners returning um, uh, to learning with the focus on, on, on young people. Um, whose job is it to, to stand up for the principles of lifelong learning for example if the you, is, is that the job of college principals of the, the college sector to be advocating the case for that or you're quite comfortable to be focused that you're, you're delivering the government's priorities uh, uh, and that's what you're funded to do? It is absolutely a priority for the principals and chief execs and their boards. And let's be clear, we are continuing to lobby in private the government and policy makers in, in that particular area. We, we do believe in lifelong learning as educationalists. We see the benefit of that. We certainly see the benefit of that for female learners as access to education. But as I mentioned earlier, it's also beneficial in terms of retraining and reskilling. However, we also realise that we are in very challenged times and priorities have to be made. And as public servants, we are trying to, to create that balance uh, and, and focus the resources uh, on the present challenges. But uh, privately uh, and continually we are raising that issue so rest assured that that issue may not get the public headlines but uh, as education as we see the benefit of that uh, and I've always seen the benefit of that and continue to make that case. Can I just, ask you, um, just a request and a question uh, in terms of the absence rates uh, I think it might be helpful I think it would be helpful for the committee to get information from the three principles of maybe over the last three or four years, what levels of absence rates there have been in percentage terms over that time. I think that would be helpful to us. And just a question in terms of the challenges faced in mergers and the point we raised about you know, effectively savings can be made through the workforce uh, and with possible redundancies. Can I just clarify, has there been any compulsory redundancies and is there any plans from any of the principles to to implement compulsory redundancies? In the case of West College Scotland, there's been no compulsory redundancies. And there's no plans? There are no plans. In the case of City of Glasgow College, uh, not only are there no plans, there's no intentions. And on merger, we actually uh, offered a three-year uh, employment guarantee for staff. And that continues. For Perth College, there have been no compulsory redundancies and no plans. OK, thank you. Voluntary services, in, in some occasions, are um, it's great on paper, but for the individuals who are given these uh, deals, uh, with the additional money that the sector has been spending on voluntary services, 
they themselves have often expressed to, to EIS representatives that they don't feel as if the process is voluntary. Um, many people, I'm sure, are, are pleased to have taken the voluntary settlements money and left the sector. But there are others who didn't want to leave the sector, but financially had no alternative but to accept the deal because the deal was better than the contractual deal. So I, I think that a, a little bit of care must be taken around the term voluntary severances because um, some people may have felt that they were forced to leave and had no choice. So, is there any specific example of that without naming or name? You know, well, I've spoken to individuals uh, who felt they had to go because the, the deal that was being offered by the college was far better than what they'd get if they, they, if they stood and um, tried to fight it in, by a statutory redundancy payment. Right. Despite the fact of being now a, a non-compulsory redundancy policy? I, I mean, I, I think this, this, the no compulsory redundancy policy doesn't exist throughout the colleges in Scotland. I mean, Paul's quite correctly men mentioned City of Glasgow College, but there isn't uh, a policy in place, uh, to my knowledge, of every other college saying, we shall not make people compulsory redundant. Uh, what, what you have was a, a letter sent out by Michael Russell as Cabinet Secretary some time ago, in which he stated that he didn't expect any colleges to make any compulsory redundancies. Okay. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Convener. Uh, first question is to Mr Little. Um, earlier, uh, you mentioned the, the situation regarding the, also the new campus and marine engineering. Uh, within the, the, the marine engineering uh, area, is that just going to be focused upon commercial and industrial uh, courses, or will there be opportunities for leisure courses there too? Um, there will be some opportunity for that. However, in the engineering, there, there, there's less of a, a demand for that. Um, the provision that you're talking about is at the Riverside campus, and we actually have six faculties, one of which is engineering. And we're very uh, delighted to have been able, through um, the non-profit distributor model, to secure a new campus, um, which, as I said, takes delivery in about 10 weeks' time on that side and next August on the city campus. So we will work closely with um, the local schools to provide access to engineering will work closely with the local community in the Gorbals area and the wider Glasgow community. Um, but we, we have planned that campus primarily for full-time education with allowing the provision um, because of the, the uh, design of the accommodation to, to expand that. And we also have additional space on that campus so that in the future we can continue to expand that. Okay, well, <coughs> so thank you. That was helpful. Um, in terms of the... Paragraph 46 of the report um, highlighted that in the 2013-14 colleges transferred a total of uh, £99 million to uh, the Arms Length Foundations. And uh, the, the, in the EIS uh, submission that we received, um, they indicated that, uh, that they, uh, they were surprised that the, uh, the, the, the report didn't actually comment on the, on the actual move of the £99 million, um, uh, obviously to the independent bodies out with the public sector and therefore not subject to public sector scrutiny. Um, in terms of the, the colleges, the, the representatives that we have in front of us, uh, have yourselves actually uh, asked uh, for any of that money from the, uh, from the foundation? Yes, we have. I, Perth College opted to use the Scottish Foundation I, which was set up I, for a, a Scotland-wide arms line foundation. I, and we have um, withdrawn funds twice from that arms line foundation, uh, once very soon after our initial deposit in April 2014 and once in March 2015. Uh, the process that we went through was very robust, very appropriate. Um, questions were asked as to uh, why uh, we needed the cash at, at that point in time and also the use that that cash, cash was going to be put to. Um, we were able to answer the questions fully and we received uh, the cash into our bank as a consequence. We are now at the stage of... I'm about to uh, uh, let a contract uh, to a construction company for a major capital build on campus and the remaining funds in the Arms Line Foundation will be drawn down in accordance with that project plan. So the whole of the remaining 
funding that we have as a college in the Arms Length Foundation will be withdrawn over the next 12 months for that particular project. West College Scotland made one transfer uh, to the Arms Length Foundation and have since then made one withdrawal. And it's not our intention to, to uh, make any more transfers to uh, the ALF. I can give an example. Last year we made a surplus of £12,000. The Arms Length Foundation were, were, in essence, was a technical response to the reclassification of colleges to protect uh, colleges and allow them um, if you like to secure and safeguard monies under the reclassification colleges are no longer to run a deficit or indeed a planned deficit so to protect that money and in our case the city of glasgow we had an excess of 19 million committed as our contribution to the overall 228 million pound for the new campus so it was absolutely essential that because we had a 25-year contractual obligation that we had monies available to do that and it it, the Armstead Foundation were, was a workable solution to that. So we, we um, put part of that money into, um, uh, in excess of 10 million into the, uh, uh, sorry, 11 million to the sector foundation and a separate 10 million in, into a uh, college foundation or an arm's length body. Of, and we have made um, submissions to both those two trusts uh, again, as Margaret said, done through open, robust, rigorous uh, submissions, and we received um, monies uh, in full from the, the from both ones to the bids that we put in. In terms of the the monies that uh, you have put a bid in for, and also uh, received uh, the, the the sums, uh, uh, Mr. Little and uh, Ms. Monkton, you mentioned um, you mentioned the capital. Um, uh, capital issues. Uh, now, in terms of the, the, the this or the particular the ALF, um, is that solely limited to capital projects, or uh, could you put a bid in to obtain money uh, for that to then be used and utilised for courses? It's in our case, I, it's res restricted in that it shouldn't uh, substitute for the current funding. So it should be of a one-off nature. So it's not necessarily restricted to capital, but capital is the easiest category that fits that, that situation. So if we were wanting to start up a, a, new, a new team or make a one-off investment that would benefit staff and students, I, that would be looked on favourably also. But the main category of that sort of one-off investment and non-recurrent investment would be a capital one. And just to reiterate, the, the, the technical response was to protect monies, and in our case it was for capital. However, uh, the constitution, or certainly of the Glasgow Foundation, allows for non-capital um, revenue. However, it, the, there was no intention to set that fund up uh, to subsidise uh, courses that either were government funded or that we could fund through our own commercial and international uh, income generation. As I say, we generate about 40% non-funded accountable monies and we would use that to support that. Um, but within the constitution of the, the Glasgow Foundation, um, the, the provision has been focused not to duplicate the, the fundable uh, course delivered in the college. Um, just uh, one final question for me. Just in terms of the, the, the Arms Length uh, Foundation, uh, I know certainly in another committee in the Parliament, in the Local Government Regeneration Committee, uh, in the past, uh, the issue of the Arms Length organisations has came up uh, on a regular basis, uh, particularly in terms of the, uh, the scrutiny uh, of them. Uh, and, the, and certainly in recent years that there has been uh, kind of a demand to have uh, an extension of freedom of information um, uh, to actually include the arms length organisations and I know certainly in some uh, that, that was undertaken in a limited fashion uh, last year or so. Um, do you think this particular um, arms length foundation should actually uh, also be included uh, under freedom of information, uh, bearing in mind it's public money that's actually uh, been utilised? I'm not sure that it is public money that has been lodged in arms length foundations because 
Um, certainly from Perth College's point of view, a lot of that was commercially generated money because we have one of the lowest dependencies in public money across Scotland. We're at 55% dependency on public money. So of the money that we've lodged in the Arms Land Foundation, I'm not sure that we could audit exactly what the, the um, route of that that money was. So there will be a mixture at best. I, I do believe in the public interest that freedom of information should extend to anything, anybody that's involved in the public sector, and that would include these ALFs. What, what's important to me is that the accounts are subject to annual external uh, audit and company reporting requirements, but also that the articles of association associated with that uh, are such that the resource can be used and should be used for the benefit of students studying vocational further education in the west of Scotland. Yeah, I think the, the important to realise about arms and body is that the uh, trusts that uh, oversee that First of all, they're subject to the regulations of Oscar, the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator, but they have no full-time staff. And I, I would hate to think an unintended consequence of excessive freedom of information is that they would have to generate some sort of secretariat. Um, certainly, the monies that have been set aside, as Margaret said, uh, in the City of Glasgow have been uh, monies that have been primarily generated through commercial and uh, international income over many, many years, and uh, given that the trusts are also subject to audit and subject to Oscar, at this stage, um, I remain to be convinced if they uh, need to be subject to FOI for the reason that I identified. Thank you. I, I do think that uh, from the interests of uh, accountability, uh, that the money generated by the FE colleges no matter what the route, it is subject to FOI requests. Um, I, I do note that surplus is generated from, from now on in by colleges, no matter what the, the source of that revenue will, will in the future be um, given to the return to government at the end of the year. Uh, and also I think it's important to, to mention that even if there are large uh, sources of private income and commercial activity, uh, which we're not against, I should add, the, that that work is still being carried out by college staff who are public employees. So the point is, from Perth College point of view, you'd be, you'd be relaxed with the option of FOI for the ELVs. That's, that's well, company. You'd be comfortable with that yeah, proposal. Well, listening, listening to Paul's reasoning, actually, I wouldn't like to see an overhead um, being incurred yeah, but let, by let, the, the Scottish Foundation. Yeah. However, um, we are, as public bodies, are FOIable, so the, the information could be obtained by asking an FOI of all the so, all the donors. So, just for clarity, like. there's the option within the. FOI Act that provides for fixatious uh, requests mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also relates to, to yeah. costs associated with it as well. Yeah, it does. Uh, so, you know, given the kind of organisations that we're talking about and the, the wealth of experiences around these organisations, it wouldn't be impossible for them to respond to FOI requests, would it? I, mean, I think there not. are other routes under FOI that that information can be obtained. Yeah. Is that the Arms and Trust Foundations are independent. Yeah, so they don't the receive any support from colleges. So they, they, they don't receive any. No support. They, no they don't indirect. receive any secretariat support from colleges. They've got their own, um, yeah. you know, support that they use themselves, and I don't even think it's, any, it's anything significant. And when I say support, though, they don't receive public money. Is that what you're saying? No, my understanding is that the monies that have been put into the two trusts that I'm aware of have come from uh, primarily monies that have been generated through commercial and international and, and, and also is committed you money. You say primarily, though, but there's still public funds involved, though, isn't there? Well, if you can imagine over many years, there's, there's been a mix, but the City of Glasgow College receives uh, millions of pounds that it generates from commercial and international, so it's difficult to disintegrate that from, from public monies that have been built up over that period of reserve time. 
Um, but I, I do want to stress the point that arm's length trusts are staffed by volunteers, trust members, that they do not have any full-time members. And, and if um, there was an, a, a number of FOI requests uh, persistently, then I, I could envisage the chairman of that trust or the trust itself then deciding to develop a, a, a part-time or even a full-time secretariat. That would then diminish the money in the trust and then that would have an ultimate effect when any college such as your own then went to bid for that money, there would be just less money there. My, my provision is that I remain to be convinced of, of the merits of FY. Okay. Thanks, Kim. Just actually something that you picked up earlier on, Ms. Cum Cumberford, uh, about the Articles of Association. And um, like it's just you're saying that it was, it was all done in a true, proper manner and whatever. Can you just um, explain to me who checks the Articles of Association when they're set up? Uh, the Articles of Association were created based on guidance that was provided by the Funding Council, but also legal, separate legal advice. Mm -hmm. So in the case of, I can give you an exact quote in terms of the Articles of Association of the ALF that is, is in, in the West, is to support students at West College Scotland and the advancement of further education generally for the benefit of the general public in the West region and the advancement of citizenship and community development. Mm -hmm. It was just to try and get the idea of um, was every ALF using the same terminology or is there differences and how could you check uh, that it was appropriate? I can't, I can't answer that specifically, but I would be surprised if they were not similar. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I, on behalf of the committee, thank the panel for their contribution this morning and we'll follow up uh, via the clerk and the uh, Request for information received. Thank you. Can I move the committee into a brief five minute suspension?
Uh, can I just reconvene the meeting calls and take us to our next uh, item? Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, our second panel witnesses uh, in Scotland's College 2015, uh, Dr Michael Foxley, uh, Chair of University Highlands and Islands for the Educational Regional Board. Uh, I'd like to welcome Michael Devaney, the Vice Principal for the Education University of Highland and Islands for the Education Regional Board, uh, and Ali Jarvis, the Interim Chair of Glasgow's Regional Board, and finally, Keith McKellar, the Chair of the West of Scotland Regional Board. I uh, understand that we have a brief statement from Dr Foxley. Yes, thank you, Chair. Very briefly to add to my written submission, it was just to put the context of the Highlands and Islands, because over 20 years ago, the colleges and other public bodies came together to work uh, to create the university, uh, and they've been working together, as I say, for over 20 years. This was achieved in February 2011. It's a federal collegiate model, the intention is that we work together regionally. And the exciting thing in the Highlands Islands is you can turn up at a leisure or, dare I say, a hobby course, gain a bit of confidence, start an FE course, and then go on to get a job or an HE course. And those of us who go to graduation ceremonies see um, people who are there who had clearly been through that progression. And that's the great thing about the Highlands and Islands. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, the first opening question will be from Mary Scanlon. Um, I, I know you were all sitting in in the previous session, so I, do, I don't want to repeat too much, but paragraphs 36 and 38 in the Auditor General's report, uh, regional bodies has resulted in a complex framework of accountability. Uh, individual colleges have expressed concerns that regional bodies will affect their autonomy and uh, they need effective leadership, etc., etc. Uh, now, what we've, uh, well, uh, just before coming to that, uh, some colleges seem to manage very well without having a regional board and uh, um, seem to function very well. Uh, but there is some concern uh, in colleges around the Highlands, as a Highlands and Islands MSP, I picked that up. So are regional boards really necessary? Uh, do they affect the autonomy? And what do you think Margaret Monckton meant when she said uh, they were restricted? And you obviously heard about the three layers of management in FE and two layers at ITCHE. And that does seem to be a very bureaucratic model in UHI. So uh, just a few questions in there. Yes, thank you very much. Um, well, I'll try to explain because it is very complicated and complex. There's 12 colleges across the Highlands and Islands deliver further education. Um, the chairs of those colleges come to the Further Education Regional Board, along with independents, two independent members through adverts, and other members from Highlands Islands Enterprise, Skills Development, Scotland, etc., local authorities, director of education. Um, the principals meet regularly at a Further Education Executive Board. Um, it's changed with regionalisation. There's, and my purpose is to get for further education to have a single voice uh, from the Highlands and Islands because 10 of the uh, regions are single college regions and it's very easy for them to have a single voice, one chair, one principal, and it's about working together. And to give you some examples of the sort of thing we were doing, um, up until I've been the FE regional lead and then the chair for the last two and a half years, there was no curriculum map in the Highlands and Islands as to who was doing what and where. Uh, that was put in place 18 months ago. For the first time ever, we have an FE curriculum plan across the Highlands and Islands. Um, it's for one year, but we're progressing to a three-year plan. Um, we've done a lot of work collectively as a team on rurality. This is significant funding for the Highlands and Islands. It's a joint case for rural colleges and rural students. For the first time ever, we've commissioned work on rural deprivation. The social inclusion funding uh, goes to the SIMD 20s and 40s. There's significant rural deprivation. There's the working poor. There's people who have to travel 50, 60 miles with, under their own transport cross ferries to access a college course. If they, some of it can be distance learning, but if you're laying bricks, you need to be there. And for the first time ever, we are exposing the extent of that rural deprivation. We've created an estates plan for the entire Highlands and Islands. Um, the last one was six years old, clearly not fit for purpose. And all of those um, work streams underway, they're done collectively with the chairs and the principals, but they do require leadership, and it's to grow the needs for the region. Um, we've managed successfully channeling some of the constraints ONS, in particular uh, commercial insurance and co-alignment of academic financial year. Um, and finally, just to come back to 
to Margaret and Perth College because she now owes me lunch. Uh, Perth College, the skills investment plan for the Highlands and Islands excluded Perth because it was in uh, Tayside and Dundee. So I and Mike and Perth College and Margaret and the then chair worked hard to make sure that Skills Development Scotland, the first part of their Tayside one, uh, included the Perth College catchment area <clears throat> because we needed uh, that information to have a comprehensive and cohesive Highlands and Islands plan. And then equally well, there was work done behind the scenes to provide European funding for the Perth catchment area. So I'm very aware of um, the potential costs and overheads, and I don't want to take any money away from students, but we have to work as a region, giving you a few examples of how we're doing that, because we need a voice for the Highlands Islands. Thank you. Can I just add that um, the, um, the, we, are, we are where we are in relation to the, to the three layers that Margaret alluded to. Uh, one has to understand the kind of genesis of that, and it was kind of unavoidable, inescapable, at a given point when it was uh, decided that uh, rather than create a new fundable body for the Highlands and Islands, the university's existing fundable body status should be invoked. And um, from that, we've, we've then got this uh, emerging. But uh, just because we've got the, the university court and then we have the, the, the committee of the court called the FE Regional Board, and now we've, got, we've also got the, the college boards, um, of itself, that doesn't actually mean that the burden should be excessive. Uh, indeed, far from it, it needs to be minimised. And um, I think generally, as we've gone about our business, indeed, I recall the first meeting, shadow board meeting on, in December 12. One of, the, one of the principles we established on that day was that we would seek to minimise the bureaucracy associated with the onset of regionalisation and the formation of this regional board. And certainly, if one understands the, the way in which we work as a region, uh, when I came into this position on the 1st of August, 2013, and prior to that, I was a principal of one of the what well, now assigned colleges, Murray College. I was a principal for eight years, so I've seen it from both sides. Um, I said that we ought to operate on the basis of distributed leadership and responsibility, and that's very much not only what I practice, but you know, preach, but what we're trying to practice. So, in other words, a, a lot of what happens in this region is actually led uh, and uh, accounted for by other uh, senior managers, principals, and senior managers from the colleges. Um, so I think it's, uh, I'm not, uh, I understand the, the uh, I think, you know, uh, Margaret's point, and I think we, we do recognise that there are tensions, and uh, again, if you go back to the Audit Scotland timeline, and you see the 1st of August 2014 was the point at which uh, the university was uh, formally became the regional body. Uh, since then, uh, other things have happened, and of course the eight colleges were assigned. But they're still unfinished business in relation to things like the financial memorandum, which we're working on at the present time. And, and these things have, it's fair to say, caused some tensions and some disagreements even. But that's uh, to be expected, and it's quite healthy in actual fact. So I think uh, hopefully uh, when the dust settles on all that, people will be reasonably satisfied with the balance that's been struck. Well, I have listened carefully to your answers, and I don't think either of you have uh, answered the, the specific question I asked on autonomy. Uh, I was a lecturer prior to coming here in uh, 1999, and uh, each of the 12 colleges in the uh, University of the Highlands and Islands uh, preciously protected their autonomy in terms of resp uh, responding to local needs and local jobs, local skills needs, and those skills needs are very different in the Western Isles, Lewis Castle compared to Shetland, compared to Inverness, Perth and elsewhere. So what I was really asking you was, uh, Margaret used the word restricted, uh, you know, you've, you've mentioned what you do, and can I say on rural deprivation, there was research being done on rural deprivation 17 years ago. Um, so what I'm asking you is, uh, have you, uh, are the colleges still autonomous in terms of uh, determining the courses they do, how they spend their money? Or I think I heard an example of a college applying to the board to provide a course that they thought was essential in that particular area and being turned down. So that's where the background to my uh, question comes from. Uh, you know, are you dictating to colleges about what they should do in an area that's 44% of the landmass of Scotland? Or are you working 
with colleges in order to ensure that they still have the autonomy that they had in the past. Can I just intervene a wee second? Just to clarify, I should have said this earlier. Can questioners and the panel please be as succinct as possible, uh, just so that we can get as many questions in as possible? Yeah, and in, in, in relation to further education, I would argue that they are still very much autonomous. Uh, if you look at the other side of the business, as we would regard it, that higher education, the degree of autonomy is much less than it used to be. It's been much less since about 2001 when, when UHI was designated. I'll give you a specific example. I mean, one, of the, one of the responsibilities of the regional board is to monitor, monitor the performance of the colleges. So I'll take two examples under, under that banner heading. We monitor the financial performance of these colleges and we monitor the quality and that is, that's the word. The key word is monitor. But in actual fact, monitor is much... It's important, and it's, a, it's a kind of dis, almost a distillation. The regional board only meets four times in the year. It's a, so it's, pretty, it's got a very significant terms of reference. It has to be very, very focused on how it spends its time, and it is very focused on how it spends its time. But if you take quality and finances, these two examples, it's very much the case that the, the, the burden and the responsibility largely still rests at college level, with college managers and with college boards. Hello, Jarvis, I wonder if you want to come in from uh, Glasgow. Yeah, the situation in Glasgow is slightly different, slightly less complex, obviously a tie to geography. I'm very clear Glasgow College's regional board only exists to add value to its assigned colleges. We have no students, we have no staff. What we can do, though, is through both support and challenge, is to enable and support our assigned college chairs and our principals to achieve more in synergy than they could do on their own. And that's the sole role of this board. I think the committee needs to be aware that nearly a quarter of the college budget goes through Glasgow. Um, and although each individual college um, has its autonomy, yes, there are some limitations um, because now they have a, set, a second tier of governance. But actually, that tier of governance should add value for Glasgow and its region. For the first time, we've got a regional outcome agreement for the whole city. Given we're dealing with CPPs, it doesn't make sense that each individual college is having the same negotiations with the same CPPs. And therefore, what we can do on a regional basis has to be something that enables that synergy. So for me, it's about strategic coherence, it's about curriculum alignment, and it's about providing clearer pathways for learners. Um, insofar as meddling in the business of principals and chairs, quite frankly, they're better at it uh, than a regional board is. Therefore, it has to be about adding value. I would tend to agree with you on that one. <laughs> okay. Scott. Yeah, maybe I could just carry on that line of questioning. So does that mean that uh, on the target of £50 million recurring efficiency savings every year, uh, given you've got a quarter of the budget in Glasgow, uh, you have to find, and you just keep you right about the regional board's role here, but you'll have to find £12 million a year, twelve and a half, twelve million a year. Significant amount of savings. And I think the thing to do with that is, again, to work in partnership. It's the college principals and the chairs who actually know their business. But the regional board, that looking over the top, can say, well, OK, are there opportunities for regional procurement that we could do across the Glasgow region that could add value and achieve savings more than could be achieved at the individual colleges? Where have we got duplication of provision? Because, again, although we recognise the importance, particularly at access learn at level, for learners to be as close as possible, those non-traditional learners or those who are furthest away from education, then something on the doorstep is very important. But actually, Glasgow region brings in people from the city, from out with the city, from internationally and nationally, because of the range of some of its specialist provision. Yeah. So, therefore, we want pathways. Okay. Therefore, there are savings. Um, this is £12.5 million in the current financial year that your regional board... I assume now has to find. You've presumably set a budget, so are you going to make those savings in this current financial year? Well, again, let's, let's just remember where we are at the moment. At the moment, um, albeit that it is now one year into its existence, Glasgow College's regional board is not yet a fully operational fundable body for a whole range of reasons. Um, on that basis, at the moment, the funding is still going directly to the assigned colleges. So it's actually not a question for you, it's a question for the I was going to say, the assigned colleges are currently making those savings and their, their budgets are balanced to achieve the savings targeted for, the, for this so coming the, year. So in 2016-17, it would be a fairer question to you as a regional board, if you become the full-time, I suppose, the interim chair, uh, that you'd, be, you'd have that responsibility for imposing that savings target, which government has set out, must be achieved across the sector, of which your share is a quarter, give or take a discussion with the Funding Council, you, you'd have a role in doing that? Yes. Yes, I would challenge your language. I think imposing is not the word. word. Well, For me, it would be about... It it's would be a target about, of government. They've it, said it. It's an Audit Scotland report. Yeah. I am 
giving to you the evidence this committee's had on audits yes. from Audit Scotland? So my approach would be to be working in partnership with the chairs and the, and the principals to identify where the savings are and where the regional board can add value to those savings. They know they've got efficiencies to make and those are the budgets that are already there. So exactly what role will the regional board make uh, take in this year, in the current financial year? In the current financial year, um, already to, uh, again, working with the, the individual assigned colleges to establish the regional outcome agreement, which sets the targets on which the funding is based, um, to have contributed to the work that was done on curriculum alignment, which again is where we start seeing the opportunities to shift provision, make provision more relevant, to avoid the duplication, and to recognise the impact of a major capital investment on curriculum provision in the Glasgow region. Okay. Yeah. Um, and also the progression and pathway analysis, which actually starts making the learner journey much clearer to navigate through the system, again ensuring that the right learners can get the right learning in the right place, yeah. which up till now has been more complicated, particularly when there were nine different colleges offering things that it wasn't always easy to follow a pathway through. Yeah, also there's a different perspective on that, I take your point. Yeah. Um, Mr. McKellar, would you like to comment on your area's uh, role in terms of achieving these savings? You'll forgive me for going on about these savings, but that, that's the main finding of the Audit Scotland report, that these savings uh, are, are to be made, but the Audit Scotland could find no evidence, quote, no evidence as to how they were being made. Could you help me with mm. that evidence? Well, of course, it's slightly different in, uh, for, for us at West College Scotland because the regional board is the college board. We're yes. a single college region. Yeah. Um, so it really is down to us to try and find those savings operating as a board with all of our, our committees. So we work very closely with, with the principal, um, community planning partnerships, with employers to try and identify and better streamline our services to try and drive as many efficiencies as we possibly can. And the merger process has allowed us to do that in many areas, areas such as procurement. Uh, in fact, Audrey uh, Cumberford uh, highlighted a few of those in her evidence. OK, well, go, give me the numbers. I mean, presumably, if it's 12 and a half for Glasgow in the current financial year, the 15-16 financial year we're now in, you have a funding, sorry, you have a savings target from the Funding Council. Could you tell the committee what that well, is? Well, we, we, we're down a, a million pounds on last year. What do you mean you're down? We're down. Uh, our funding this year from the Scottish Funding Council is £49.9 million. Pounds. Previously, it was £50.9 million for the previous financial year. Yeah, but that's not, that's not the same as a savings target. That's the grant you have received from the Funding Council. Yes. On and top of that, you presumably are asked to make a savings, to make savings on top of that reduction in funding you've received from the Funding Council. Would that be right? Yes, to, to an extent we are, yes, but, 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 but not, not explicitly. We, we, we try to make up as much as we possibly can through commercial yeah. and other sure. sources sure. of income. Yeah. So, um, so, sorry, just to be clear, there's no instruction on you from the Funding Council to make savings in well, line with the £50 million target the government set out when they announced the whole college merger proposals? Well, cer certainly um, not explicit targets on well, that Well, there's an basis. implicit one, then. <laughs> I think <laughs> there's an explicit, explicit target. Yeah, yes, because you, basically you've had, you've had a reduction... Uh, in your core grant. Our core grant basically covers our staff sure, costs, sure. so we've got to try and uh, make that, that up in some other way okay. or reposition our services to allow us to deliver. And you'll forgive me for just seeking clarity on this. There's no letter, you don't have an email, there's nothing from the Funding Council. Is it a spoken word from the Chairman of the Funding Council? I mean, how does this system now work? The, how, does, how the system works now is you have your, your regional outcome agreement, which you signed up to for, for three years, and Every, every uh, April, you're given an indication of what your funding will be yeah. uh, to start in August. So that really is that's that's one of the key... That's as much as you get. That's pretty much it, yes. So the £50 million is neither here nor there. In terms of how you operate as a regional board, uh, you're, you don't recognise this £50 million figure in terms of what it means to you as a regional board. I'm not sure I follow you in terms of... Well, the Audit Scotland report, Mr McKellar, said mm -hmm. that the government set out to save £50 million every year from the current financial year and they couldn't find any evidence of it. What I'm asking you as a regional board chair, because you obviously know this mm -hmm. very, very well mm -hmm. indeed, is how does that affect your, the running of your business? And what you're really telling the committee is it doesn't, because you get... Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm not saying that. I think perhaps we're, we're talking slightly at uh, cross-purposes in terms of how I've, I've picked you up. We have made savings of £6.1 million since merger. And what year was that? That was 
14. When this six last months. year. Since, since we merged, we merged a year past in, in August. So over that, that period of time, we have saved 6.1 million pounds. Okay, so that's very helpful. But, but that's a savings figure per, annual, per, per annum, or is that a one-off savings figure? No, some of that will relate to staff costs. Um, yeah. For instance, about 5.4 million of that. Will I think relate. the principal said that earlier Yes, on. so yeah. that will relate to staff costs, and that will be ongoing. Some of the other savings perhaps will be more one-off savings due to, uh, due to the nature of, of the merger process. Others will continue, continue on. Okay. Uh, is the regional board audited? It is, yes. By whom? We have an external auditor. And is that a private company? Just uh, it is. To... There is a, a process. We, we are audited um, pretty much in a similar way to the old colleges sure. would sure. be audited. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have uh, external auditors who come in and, and, and look at our books. We also, under ONS, require to provide information to, to the Funding Council on a regular basis as well as part of that process. Okay, can I thank you very much for that. One final question, if I may, to Dr Foxley, about how the relationship works between the Funding Council and your committee. Uh, goodness, goodness knows how the court fits into this, but, but the, does, has the Funding Council given your committee any instructions in relation to savings in the same way that I've been asking your colleagues from the West and from Glasgow? Uh, no. No. There's no instruction on savings. There's been no mergers. No, We're indeed, seriously looking at shared services, IT. There may be other sure. services to share yeah. across the colleges. Yeah. Uh, and just to make it clear, if I can, um, the FE Regional Board, which does report to the University Court, is, is virtually autonomous. And um, uh, I fiercely protect the autonomy of the colleges because Shetland, Perth, Inverness, they've got very different uh, demands, very different interests. And it's very important that we collect that information. But at the end of the day, we're trying to have a single teamwork approach in the Highlands Islands, so we've got one voice to speak for. That's the, it's a very light touch to garner that information, whether it's issues, problems, wishes. And we have certainly not rejected any course. If I could just maybe come back on Mary Scanlon's point. That sort of issue would be discussed. Bill Ross of Orkney uh, leads on curriculum planning. It will be discussed by the principals within their own uh, merit. What we're trying to do is to try and... and ensure that if there is an initiative, there is funding comes in for learning and teaching materials. It's, it's to add and support and make the whole bigger than the individual parts. That, that's, that's our aim. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, dear. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Um, just trying to explore one or two questions here in relation to uh, your relationships with the colleges. In the Auditor General's report, she refers to college pension reserves having in, uh, college pension deficits having increased by 75%. To what extent do you take any interest in that or are concerned in that, or is that left completely to the colleges? Sorry, is this from the Highlands? There's an island. This, oh. this is in general. Yeah, it's left to the colleges. I mean, it's, can I, maybe I can start with that. I mean, again, remembering that the Post-16 Act has got quite clear statutory divides between the role of the regional board and the role of the assigned colleges. And essentially, as I said before, the regional boards are not the employers. Where we see things such as the challenges on pensions, the regional board has an opportunity to take that helicopter strategic view and say, OK, this looks like the problem we've got coming over the horizon. What can we do on a regional basis to address that strategically? However, we are not the employer. So are the regional boards actually taking that, uh, that view of it and are they having any discussions with colleges? These are the types of discussions that are ongoing and I know the individual college boards as they look at their own uh, positions are very mindful of that fact. Mm. Doesn't sound like a lot's happening there to be honest. Um, there's also reference to in the Auditor's report, General's report to the need for long-term financial planning. Now, given the fact that uh, the present structure has been in place for a very short time, it's probably a bit of a challenge to achieve that. But the Auditor General refers to a 10-year plan. Do you think that's feasible? On certain things, it has to be. You'll have heard my colleague Paul talk about a 25-year 25, 25 plan on the campus. You have to be able to plan long term. But clearly, there are constraints within the current system, particularly in terms of classification of colleges, reclassification under ONS. It does change the nature. Our regional outcome agreement is three years, um, and clearly the, the part of the role of the regional boards is to help the assigned colleges provide that longer-term view. I would imagine part of the problem is the Scottish Government itself doesn't really know what its budget is year on year, as has just been demonstrated. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we talked about the reclassification of the colleges as public bodies and the issues around autonomy there. The Auditor General actually referred to autonomy and flexibility. Now, we've kind of explored the autonomy side. How has the flexibility been impacted by, by, the, by this change? Again, I think the principles touched on it. The key flexibility is the inability to either run a deficit or get loans. So you're talking about a recurrent annual budget. And you've already talked at some length about the arm's length foundations as being a technical um, way of addressing some of the issues about earned income and how to put that back into the system. But I think the flexibility is largely around financial management. Mm. Reference has been made about earlier on in the discussion about... Uh, monitoring the colleges. Does that translate into additional reporting requirements, uh, more statistics being produced? Uh, is there any evidence that regional boards are actually asking for additional requirements from colleges, which obviously would put a bureaucratic strain on? We're um, certainly trying to avoid that at all costs. In fact, um, early on, we set up a group to consider the terms of reference of the regional board and to ende and endeavour to, to try and avoid at all costs any duplication, because I mean, we, are, we must all, we must try and avoid uh, two different bodies uh, assuming the same res responsibility and falling over each other. So again, in, uh, if you take, for instance, the um, issue of monitoring of quality, um, what the regional board does is uh, look at uh, Education Scotland review reports, uh, college reviews, uh, also looks at the annual. Uh, uh, paper that colleges provide to the funding council, but, which is signed off by the board, which the board uh, indicates uh, um, its satisfaction with the quality arrangements that are in place. So what we do from that is we kind of then, I personally, that would then take these reports and then distill them. So in other words, the regional board gets the kind of overview. The regional board would then be, by exception, made aware of things that appear to be wrong or not so good, but the regional board would not be expected to uh, pour over nine separate reports, which may be 10 to 15 pages in length. That's already been done at the college level, and that's as it should be. I would say on that. Well, we've worked hard with um, the board secretaries of the individual assigned colleges to look at the schedule of meetings for the year, to ensure that the audit, the performance, the resources committees all align, so wherever possible we can repurpose existing data and materials, such that in adding that extra layer of um, synergy, if you will, or oversight, then what we can actually really focus on, as my colleague says, is very much about identifying exceptions, identifying variances from trend, and then seeking where, as a regional body, we can support the transfer of good practice um, and learn between each of the assigned colleges so each can be helped in being as efficient and effective as possible. Presumably, where there are multiple colleges within a region, there is now a uniform system of uh, producing reporting, indi performance indicators, and so on, and that boards are able to tap into that. Yes. It's largely getting there. I mean, it would be, it would be disingenuous to say it was perfect um, because, remember, we've gone in a short period of time in Glasgow alone from nine colleges to three assigned colleges and one regional board, and each of those colleges had different starting points and has been on a different journey of merger. So we're not yet at the point where it's absolutely consistent. No, I recognise we're still very early in this. Yeah, of course, we are, uh, you know, there's, there's multi-college regions and there's us, and we've still got the nine. Um, but, yeah, I mean, one of the, um, again, early on, what we, one of the priorities was to start, we had to understand this region. What was the starting point? There was very, you know, we, we didn't really, as a regional board, have anything to go with. And I think there was a, certainly a, a, an information deficit. So we have um, established a student data sharing group. So, again, here we have an example of, an, of a body that actually includes members from uh, most of the colleges. So we are generating this stuff increasingly at a regional level, but that's not just for the benefit of the regional board. It's also the, the data that's being uh, used. There's actually the, the data that will then be used at board level, college board level, senior management level, and course, even at course level by, by the colleges. So um, these are clearly, uh, it's kind of akin to a shared service, you might say. And is there any mechanism in existence whereby the different boards can communicate with each other, transfer good practice, you know, where, where, where someone comes across something that's a really good idea to do? Yes, through Colleges Scotland. And all of the regional chairs um, sit together and meet on a regular basis. So, again, that transfer, that learning can be done on a national basis. Has that, I mean, I realise, again, early days, but has it proven effective at all? 
Well, certainly from my point of view, because I've been going to those meetings for two and a half years, I find it extremely useful to meet the other um, FE regional chairs and get insights into some of the solutions they're working at, some of the problems they're dealing with, where their success is. It's a very great venue. If I can very briefly just come back on the commonality, as give you a specific example from the Highlands Islands, between the, four, the university and the 13 colleges, there were 14 risk registers, but they were all different. There's now a common template, so people are having their risk register, we can assess across the entire Highlands and Islands what the risks are and how they're being mitigated. So that's an example of the sort of work that's underway. Most of the bureaucracy and the additional work comes from the burden with ONS because there's monthly reporting, there's monthly cash flow issues, but that's entirely independent of regionalisation, the FE Regional Board. Thank you. Can I just take Ms Jarvis back to the point? I think there was a statement you made earlier, a point you made a helicopter strategic overview. Would that would that include areas like pay awards? So potential you know, pay awards? Well, obviously, we're moving um, into an area of national bargaining. So clearly, actually, that's a bigger helicopter view. That's for Scotland as a whole. And um, that's, again, what the chairs are working on together um, to ensure there's an aligned approach to that. I mean, what I meant in terms of the helicopter view is much more around things like working with the key employers, ensuring that the regional-wide stakeholders are involved and that they're not having to deal with three colleges. So would it also look at compulsory redundancies or potential redundancies? Would it okay. extend to that possibility? I think this is a case of form follows function. When you identify what needs to be delivered in a region, then you can identify what resources you require to deliver that. And certainly, as the three assigned colleges have worked together on the process of curriculum review and provision mapping, particularly in the light of a very large, two very large new buildings in Glasgow, there's clearly been some movement between the colleges. And provision that was previously being delivered by one has now subsequently moved to be delivered by another. Clearly, there will be a staff change that's associated with that. So, so, so can I ask, in terms of the activity, probably the Glasgow one, but could, one that could we could consider the experience of? Has there been discussions about workforce planning across the three? That's colleges? part of the curriculum planning, yes. Yeah, so that kind of discussion is taking place. So I take it there has been discussions about potential redundancies then? Well, most of the work that's gone on has gone on through the merger process. I mean, again, anything that's now looking is looking forward from the work that's been done on curriculum review, and that's an ongoing process. And I think, quite frankly, as the learner need changes and we seek to reflect both learner requirements and the requirements of the economy through developing Scotland's young workforce and our major regional employers, then there will always have to be flexibility in that system because we're never going to get to a point where we can look back and say, we've done it, that's now it. It's going to be evolving because our economy is evolving and our learner needs are evolving. Okay. Yes, Just a, a point on that. The 2012 Audit Scotland report on colleges did... Uh, look at national pay bargaining. Uh, as an ex-lecturer, uh, I am aware that within the UHI network, uh, some uh, lecturers are paid around and up to £5,000 less per annum than lecturers in the central belt of Scotland. Are we really looking at national pay bargaining for the whole of the FE sector in the near future and how would you reconcile the considerable differences between college lecturers in UHI and your college, Sue? I guess the quick how answer, can that be done? I guess the quick answer to your second point is with great difficulty. It's never easy to align um, scales, but this is certainly something, and Scotland colleges are leading on this, um, that the college sector has been clearly tasked by government to, achieve, to, to move towards national bargaining. Um, and you know, working very closely with the unions and the staff groups and you know, across the sectors, that is underway and is well underway. Perhaps Keith wants to say more. Is there more. a time scale to achieve that? Uh, yes, perhaps I could, I could come in on that. Actually, we are currently in a situation where we're asking all of the colleges to sign up to a national, uh, an NRPA national um, protocol and recognition procedure. Um, that's been backed by Colleges Scotland and uh, the principals in the college sector and is currently out with uh, the colleges just now, out to their boards. So we're, we're, we're hopeful of um, the colleges signing up to that quite soon, really quite soon. Months or years? I hope, I hope weeks and months rather than anything else. Thank you. Bruce Smith. 
convener. Uh, earlier on, uh, Mary Scanlon raised uh, the, the question of planning for courses. And um, uh, could you just take us through the, 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 the role that college boards, uh, regional college boards, have either uh, those that are currently uh, in charge, if you like, and those that will assume more responsibility as time goes on? What, what is your uh, process in relation to the decisions about uh, course planning? If I can just kick off then, I mean, the first process is agreeing the regional outcome agreement, which is essentially the contract with the funder about what will be provided in what ways. And that's based on a number of factors. The analysis of the regional demographics, the analysis of the market and economic need, um, the demand from learners, and all of that feeds in to shaping the type of provision that will be needed within a, a, in a region. Within then a number of assigned colleges, we work with our partners in those colleges to identify how that can best be delivered. Are there certain things such as access courses that need to be duplicated in a number of places so they're very close to source? And are there specialisms, and Glasgow's got a classic in terms of its nautical studies, you know, there is a, a, you know, a, a country leading, if not world leading excellence there, sure. and it would be foolish for all three colleges to be offering that when clearly City can offer it in the best position. So that would then be negotiated, but we know the types of volume we're looking at, and we know what the demographics, the market need, the economic need, and our regional partners. And within that, I include pre-16 schools. I include um, our higher education partners with whom we have articulation arrangements. So all of that is what feeds into the types of courses. Mm. And, and that process has presumably already begun over the last year. You will, you've seen yeah. changes in where courses are delivered. Absolutely. And, it's, and you know, the, the regional outcome agreement is public um, and makes clear what provision and what types of um, courses will be offered in Glasgow, and I'm sure does in UHI as well. Yeah. If I can just briefly add to that, I mean, we're looking for growth. We're looking 1%, 2%. There's areas of unmet demand. We've got European funding coming through uh, to bolster that. But what we've got, to, and as I mentioned earlier, we've got a one-year curriculum plan, but we're Bill Ross, led by Bill Ross from Orkney, we're looking at a three-year curriculum plan. But it's critical that uh, we look at regional performance. So, for example, in the 13-14 year, uh, three of the colleges underperformed, and under the old system, they would have had a clawback, a significant clawback. But because uh, nine of the colleges overperformed, the region overall overperformed. So uh, Mike leaves for that. It's a, it's a question of clever monitoring. And as Al has been saying, trying to assist and support to make sure that collectively the region overperforms. Otherwise, an individual college could have faced a clawback of third half a million pounds. So that's very important that we look at that as well as we're looking ahead for the growth. I think the challenges that we face are obviously quite different from Glasgow. And, uh, uh, it was cited earlier on that a big uh, part of the drive for uh, regionalisation was the determination to deal with overlap and duplication. Um, we would clearly, given our geographic context, um, it's difficult to identify the existence of either of those things. However, I think we do have to recognise that there is duplication of effort when it comes to the creation of learning and teaching materials. So we have already invested heavily in creating um, the platform for our FE learners to begin to access materials in, this, in the way that our higher education learners have assumed for years and years. Um, and another key development that's been mentioned this morning is the um, developing Scotland's young workforce. Now, there's a case in point. We're working with Skills Development Scotland. They've made it very plain that they have worked very hard, diligently, and I, th I applaud the work they've done in Highlands Islands over this last year or 18 months in getting us to where we've got to which is from this August, there'll be 10 pathfinders and foundation apprenticeships across the Highlands Islands, another 10 to follow in 16, 17. But they have said that they really do not, do not want and cannot carry on investing as their time and energy as much as they have over this last week. Well, they want us to do that. And they want it coordinated. They want, they want to be able to come to a place where it's beat. So again, although no one at the centre of the world is actually going to, on the ground, do the hard graft that needs to be carried on at a local level by the colleges working with their schools and employers, they, they do want it coordinated, they do want it, and, and there's a benefit in that because, again, we are seeing advantage in actually sharing practice and also um, sharing the development of, of materials, rather than nine colleges all set about that in parallel, which is crazy. So, um, could you maybe give me an indication of what's happened to travel times for students? Um. <laughs> Again, I can only speak from the Glasgow perspective. Glasgow's a weird one because actually when we looked at travel times pre-merger, 
Um, the, you actually found students travelling past colleges offering the same provision to get to other colleges that were offering that provision. So there was something about attraction, um, and I think that's peculiar with the previous layout of colleges in Glasgow. So uh, our, our approach is very much keep access as close as possible to user, because that's the critical path. That's the path back into education on a lifelong basis for those for whom education has perhaps failed them first time round. As you go more and more specialist, then you will probably move that into fewer places, but provide a higher quality experience with better resources and better facilities. And certainly, you know, the work we've done with students has indicated, I think, as one of my colleagues from West said, they're actually finding that gives them a better learning experience um, because they can guarantee at those higher levels they've got better resources, better focus and better environments in which to learn. And, and in Glasgow, the distances aren't actually enormous. You know, it's, it's, it's one more stop on the bus. Uh, sure, the distances might not be enormous, but you're talking about a region with the lowest ca car ownership in the country and uh, the expense of public transport, so I think these issues are important, wherever you live. Um, it, what, I, mean, I don't disagree with anything you said there, but what I didn't pick up was what's actually happened to travel times, up or down? Or, I mean, I presume you measure in terms of averages, in terms of maximums? I'd have to come back on the detail, but as I said, the data we had beforehand but was that, that be they... something that would be pretty key to... To, if you're making decisions about courses being moved around the city, that would be something you would always look at? Because it's one thing to talk about duplication, but my constituents might call duplication local availability. Yeah, I agree. And as I say, access courses very close, local availability. I'll have to come back to you because it was within the curriculum review they looked at that, and I don't have that data to hand. Okay. Um, earlier on... Um, uh, asked the principals about maybe some of the, uh, the principles about the principles of further education, um, and we talked about uh, uh, the position of lifelong learners um, in the system currently, the position of uh, uh, women learners and other learners who might be more reliant upon um, part-time courses. Mm -hmm. uh, whose role is it to defend these principles in further education in Scotland? Well, probably not at all. Uh, for our part, uh, and it's not an easy thing to do uh, at the time, at this time, given what was outlined earlier. Um, and it's was suggested by some of the, by the principals. I mean, certainly, I think, insofar as as that's it's been possible, I think uh, colleges have uh, striven uh, to actually hang on to the vestiges of the. I mean, it's been a kind of Scottish tradition, hasn't it? Um, and, um, but it's been uh, made more and more difficult by the way in which things have been, you know, the, the rules have changed, but you know about the hours and also specifically what can be funded. Um, so it does still survive. Um, and indeed, if you look at the, I talked earlier on about us um, trying to understand this region uh, at, the, at the outset, and it's quite remarkable when you look at the profile of each college and you look at the, the, the balance of activity. Um, some of our smaller colleges, uh, Orkney, Shetland, have more part-time learners than most of our big colleges. Now, there's, and there are very few full-time places. I mean, um, the, the number of full-time course, full courses offered in uh, Orkney or Shetland is about nine full, this FE courses compared to, I think, over 50 at Inverness. Now, that is one of the early, has been one of the early, early priorities of the regional board. Uh, how do we begin to address that imbalance and again, back to the mention of regional planning earlier, it's very interesting to note that the, uh, in large measure, where, where the, the drive is coming from and the thirst for more FE in the Highlands Islands is in these, in these places. So um, it's really uh, walking a bit of a tightrope to try and keep all these things uh, in play at the same time. Some of the colleges, of course, in the past have entered into, with, into relationships with the local authorities whereby they've taken over what was described earlier on, I think it's adult learning or leisure classes came over to colleges. In other cases, that didn't what, happen. What I'm hearing is that it's no one's job to, do, to defend these. Well, I, mean, I, I think Mr Little said that, that he had um, you know, privately uh, discussed these issues with ministers. Uh, I'm not hearing a great uh, urge from, from regional board chairs to say we see that as part of, as part of our role. Well, I, I mean, I suppose the question uh, that, that would then lead me to, I mean, it, it, you know, asked earlier about could we merge further, could we find different models and make even further savings? I mean, if these institutions and and bodies are just there to deliver government's priorities, then you know, we could do this nationally, couldn't we? No, no, I'll, uh, I'm very fiercely protective and defensive and supportive of further education because I've seen the transformation it makes. I was 18 years chair of Lochaba College and then chair of West Highland College in the area where I was the local GP 
And I've seen people who've been given a, the NFE certificate and go on to get a job or an HE, the HE degree and go on to get a seriously good job, who a few years earlier had not a hope of doing that. There's 70 learning centres across the Highlands and Islands, and one of my favourite ones is going to Malig, and Jane there regularly grabs hold of people who are basically in a dead-end job or no job at all and convinces them to go on a weekend course, and they end up merchant shipping courses, uh, working for Caledonia McBrain, um, running their own boat. So I, I've seen that transformation, and to me, it's, it's, it's the absolutely vital end of it. And I think part of the job that we have as uh, regional chairs is to convince the Scottish Government that when they're giving funding to, to tackle inequality, they need to give it to the colleges and they need to give it for further education, because we're the people who make the real difference in terms of tackling inequality. I'm sorry if there was a wee pause at the beginning. I was just I trying think, to... I think perhaps confusion is the nature of the question, whose responsibility it is, because the obvious but somewhat trite answer is, of course, it's all of our responsibilities. Um, it's how we do that and how we balance a range of competing demands, which you'll be very familiar with in terms of public policy and public finances, that um, there will always be trade-offs and we have to be constantly balancing those. And I think the, 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 the other principle that applies to that will always be one of public value and how we match what government wants, what learners want, what indeed us, our employers want. And I think, again, when you add in the developing Scotland's young workforce and you see what some of the employment and the economy demand, sometimes they're different things as well. So I think the question is one of judgment, how to take a range of often competing views and try and come up with the most elegant, appropriate solution that best meets the needs of the learners, first and foremost, and the country in terms of what those learners d d deliver. Okay. Well, maybe in a slightly different way. I mean, I can understand that the, the role of principals in, in college boards, uh, and I appreciate in some cases college <coughs> boards and regional boards are, are essentially the same thing, but um, uh, that they have a management function of, of the college itself and the learning that's going on. Um, the regional boards, the, and we talked about earlier the, the, the tension that exists in the, the audit report of what we don't hear in this is the voices of people who perhaps might have had the opportunity to be in the system in the past, but are, uh, we know as a, a fact, you know, several thousand of them are not in college education as a result of, of the policy changes that have been made. Is it the job of the regional board to take into account those, the views of, of those people? And how do you go about uh, assessing what the demands for, for college education, whether it's part-time, later learning or, or anything else? I think say, for example, Glasgow, how, how do you assess yeah, what that is? I think one of the first things to do is understand it, because if you look at the Glasgow figures, one of the most significant areas of our part-time decline is pre-16 learners. So, again, we're not talking here... I mean, there are some older learners and some workplace re returners, but the colleges have done an awful lot to try and protect that deliberately for all the reasons you highlight. One of our most significant declines is pre-16 school children, where obviously there was arguably a duplication between money being put into the public sector at pre-16 and them also having enrolled places in colleges at the same time. Um, clearly that is changing and as we move into both curriculum for excellence and the working with developing Scotland's young workforce, we can put that on perhaps a more effective platform um, because one of the challenges for the, um, some of the school college partnership work that was done over the last, you know, sort of let's say six to four years ago was perhaps some of that was delivering less for them and less for the public value. So some of it we need to understand where the change is, not simply go out and ask people who aren't at college why they're not at college. Um, in the previous session, um, I had the example from Paul Little regarding the marine engineering uh, in, the, in the city of uh, Glasgow uh, College. And uh, so with, the, with the current, well, with the new arrangements, uh, obviously uh, the, the work that yourselves will undertake for something from a board level is to work within your own, uh, your own particular region. But uh, are there any opportunities to actually uh, work cross region? between the colleges. An example I could provide would be potentially uh, with the marine engineering, um, the courses that will be offered. There may be uh, maybe a better facility elsewhere within Scotland to provide maybe some aspects uh, of, the, of the courses or training. And so would that be allowed under the, under the new arrangements? 
there's anything to stop it. And I think it would be, again, one of those opportunities to add value. I mentioned already that Glasgow already has some national provision that doesn't just service the Glasgow region. Um, it services Scotland as a whole and beyond. And I think, you know, I'm sure fellow chairs um, would, would see that as an opportunity. We already work with colleagues in higher education from the university sector in terms of articulation pathways that go well beyond the region. So that, that, that principle is there. Um, I think the challenge, not the challenge, the opportunity for the regional boards, they are still new bodies. As I said, Glasgow yet is not a fully operational fundable body, but these are the sorts of things that I think provide the clear strategic opportunity for both enhanced provision, um, mo more effective use of public money, and better transfer of good practice. And that's where I think the regional boards can add value, perhaps over and above the individual co colleges. No, no, thank you. That's helpful. Okay, can I, on behalf of the committee, thank the, the panel for the contribution this morning. I don't think we have any correspondence that we need to follow up, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, can I move into, now move to agenda item number three, uh, which is a section 23 report, uh, managing early departures from the Scottish public sector. Uh, can I advise colleagues that we have a response from the Scottish Government in relation to the AGS report entitled the uh, Managing Early Departures report from uh, the Scottish public sector. Uh, I just wonder if colleagues have any comments on response. Davis Scott. Can I just suggest that, uh, that we need to consider this really important area very carefully and I want to come back to it. There has been some evidence this morning and there's been some evidence in other sessions that do relate to some of the issues that we have discussed previously as a committee on uh, settlement agreements and the complexity of them and what they mean in the long term. Now, the government's uh, helpful response gives us something to go on, but we may want to reflect on that in light of even this morning's evidence and I wonder if it might be appropriate to come back to that at a later stage. Okay. Any other comments? I would, I would tend to agree with that. It was also raised in the Audit Scotland report, the Scottish colleges, that there are another, at least another two colleges where the early departures are to be questioned in, in more detail. So I would prefer to do a, a proper job on this, to take time, consider it more thoroughly and uh, to come back to it. I think that's a sensible approach. So can I just confirm that in the middle of the... The meeting is that we, the committee is that we defer this and, uh, until a further stage where we can give further consideration. Is that agreed? Agreed. Okay. Okay. I now move the committee into private session as previously agreed.